So logistic regression. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to go back to maximum likelihood and maximum posteriority and so on, just to motivate a little bit why on earth we had this weird, you know, least mean squares loss. So maximum likelihood and maximum posteriori. So remember, this is our normal distribution, right? So it's p of x is 1 over squared 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared, right? And that's what it looks like. Pretty boring, right? Um, and then everybody knows, well, you know, if you want to get the mean, well, you take all the numbers, you sum them up, and you divide by n. And, you know, maybe, you know, an elementary school kid or, a, you know, something like that, they might already know about averages, right? And they just, like, take those numbers, sum them up, divide, like, hey, let's divide all the cake fairly, you know, sum up all the cake pieces and split them in three if it works. Uh, they probably don't know about variance, but, you know, everybody learned at some point, hey, a good variance estimate is 1 over n, sum over i equals 1 to n, xi minus mu hat squared. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated if you want to do things right, because you need to, yeah. But anyway, so for now, we, we're not going to go into any finesses here. But the obvious question is, why on earth is this actually a good idea, right? I mean, this is the first thing you learn, but then why that, right? And you could say, yeah, because that's the mean and the variance of the Gaussian, but, you know, how did we get there? Um, so let's actually derive this from first principles. And we're going to do that by looking at something called a likelihood. So the idea is we start with some data x, maybe x1 through xn. And in this case, I'm going to assume that the data has been drawn from a Gaussian. So I'm assuming that I have p of x as parameterized by mu and, mu and sigma squared. Okay. So do you notice that there's this fun, really weird notation here where I'm not using a conditional but just a semicolon? Because I'm just treating mu and sigma squared as parameters of that distribution as opposed to as conditioned on these parameters. So these are just parameters that I so happen to pick. Question, yes? Pardon? Do both versions have any practical difference? Well, in, w in terms of the interpretation, they mean different things. So in one case, I'm assigning some statistical meaning to mu and sigma squared as, you know, maybe being drawn from some distribution or something. In the other case, they are just some parameters, like the fact that I might code things up in Python or the fact that, well, it rained this morning. <coughs> so they are just, you know, facts at this point. <coughs> and of course I can go and write it out as I would. So I have the product i going from 1 to n, 1 over 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus, you know, xi minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. Now, if I want to find parameters that fit the data really well, you know, for instance, you know, I could choose between a Gaussian and maybe, you know, an exponential distribution and five other distributions that there could be. But if I pick a Gaussian, then I might go and, you know, maximize p of x as parameterized by mu and sigma squared with regard to mu and sigma squared. Right. So I'm going to maximize the likelihood that the data was generated by the model. Right. It's not the probability because I can, you know, muck around with mu and sigma squared and so at this point it's no longer a probability, right? But the only thing is that if I look at, you know, those likelihoods, those numbers will get very, very small as I take many terms. So the obvious thing you do is rather than maximizing something that goes to zero, you take the negative log of it and now you again have something that's fairly well behaved. So you minimize minus log p of x given mu and, well, parameterized by mu and sigma squared. Okay, so this is really just cosmetics right now. <coughs> so let's actually do this. So I minimize minus log p of x parameterized by mu and sigma squared, 
And I can decompose it because every single observation was drawn independently, identically from the same distribution. So sometimes statisticians, okay, let me take care of Mr. Onyate and Indian villages. Okay, so I can go and decompose this. Okay, so IID identically independently distributed. This is the assumption that you want to see for your real data. This is when things are really nice. Basically, just means you can use one distribution for everything. It's like a parallel for all do equivalent. Anyway, so in our case, uh, therefore the likelihood, the negative log likelihood decomposes into terms for every single xi. So you get a common term, namely one half log of two pi sigma squared. So that makes n over two of them. And then I get the one over two sigma squared xi minus mu squared. So I can just pull the sum in. And so I get basically something that doesn't depend on mu and something that does. And so now if you were to minimize that with regard to mu, you'd find that this is minimized for mu equals one over n, sum over i equals one to n xi. Um, I'm not going to go and do this now explicitly because you've probably seen that derivation somewhere before. But this <coughs> now shows that mu is actually the optimal solution for that. Okay. Now, if I want to do the same thing for the variance, well, I take the same expression that I had above and take the derivative with regard to sigma. Now I'm going to do something a little bit sneaky. I'm going to take the derivative with regard to sigma squared, with otherwise the expression just gets long and tedious. And so now the d sigma squared is n over two sigma squared minus one over two sigma to the four, sum of i going from one to n xi minus mu squared. And of course this needs to vanish for optimality. And so if I solve for sigma, I get exactly the well-known variance. So what does this all have to do with regression? Well, um, it's that this is exactly what we are going to use and what we're using when we are performing a least mean squares fit. But before that, let's look a little bit at what maximum likelihood estimation really means. Okay, so if I have, let's say, a likelihood of my parameters, and I just happen to pick a Gaussian here, but whatever, then maximum likelihood will just go and find, you know, the mode of that distribution. Okay. In this case, it looks quite nice. Yes? Um, so, because pi doesn't really depend on anything, right? And since I have the log of two pi, sigma squared, since it's a constant, it just gets differentiated out. So the derivative killed it. <coughs> um, but okay, so if I have as my, you know, parameters for the likelihood, then I, I'm just going to pick the mode of that distribution, which is okay. But if I have that as my likelihood profile, I'm going to pick the thing that's here on the peak. And that may not be quite the right thing that I might want to do. And here I definitely wouldn't want to do that. So something is a little bit off, right, with our maximum likelihood estimates. Let's pick something a little bit closer to home. Let's say you didn't do your homework. Then, okay, so that's the data. 
Now I can come up with maybe four different parameterizations. Okay. And they will all perfectly well explain the data being while well, you didn't do the homework. One is the dog ate the homework. Okay, homework's gone, right? Perfectly well explains it. You were abducted by aliens. Okay. Also perfectly reasonable explanation for the fact that you didn't do the homework or maybe you were too lazy or maybe your grandmother was sick, right? And <coughs> you know, all those parameters perfectly well explain the data. Now, of course, uh, if you, you know, go to the TA, you would probably go and not necessarily come up with the alien hypothesis first. Why is that so? Okay, why wouldn't you say, hey, I was abducted by aliens and that's why I couldn't do the homework? Yes? They wouldn't believe it. They would not believe it. Why would they not believe it? Because no one gets abducted by aliens. Okay. Um, Right. So let's look at that, right? So <coughs> let's look at the posterior probability, right? So this is now where, where we are turning our parameters from just parameters into something that's actually drawn from some unknown distribution of, you know, possible explanations. And if you think about, you know, the lazy student versus sick grandma versus dogs, and okay, maybe we are a little bit too close to area 51. So let's give the probability uh, f the, for alien abduction, okay, let's make it, you know, 0.01%, that's pretty high. And the dog, you know, it's pretty close to 1% and the sick grandma pretty close to 20% and, you know, with 80% you're lazy. So then the posterior probability, just using Bayes' rule, would be given by, you know, the likelihood of the data, so P of X, parameterized by W, so given W, times the, you know, the prior probability of that parameter being reasonable. And what happens is that now, you essentially end up adding a penalty term over the parameters to your standard maximum likelihood problem. So sometimes people talk about penalized maximum likelihood and what they're doing is maximum a posteriori, and by the way, regularized maxent does the same thing. So people have invented the same algorithms under a lot of tricks, lots of names, and we'll actually see some of those in this class. So in the context of, you know, this class, uh, of, of, you know, estimating means and variances, I would maybe have minus log of P of X parameterized by mu and sigma squared, minus log P of, actually in this case, mu and sigma squared. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a typo here. Um, so in the homework example, while everything has perfect log likelihood, the prior is obviously vastly different, and so the TA will infer, well, you probably didn't do the work because you were too lazy. Okay. So, yeah, what does this all have to do with what Mu talked about last Friday? Well, what we basically have in regression is we compare our observations yi with our model f of x, i, and w. And then we have an additional penalty, namely just corresponding to minus log of p of w. And so this will make sure that we don't pick crazy parameters. So in our case, we have this very simple data generation model. yi is f of x, i, and w plus epsilon i. And then maybe you put the Gaussian prior on W. Mind you, if you know ha you had taken a machine learning class about four or five years ago, um, so this is what I was teaching at CMU for PhD level, this would have been a fairly advanced model to implement for PhD students. You're going to do something slightly more complex than that in your homework, easily. It's going to be only a few lines. Yes? So a question, um, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? I have a question about that. Uh, yeah, so are we saying that given, if we assume the same for all options of the priors, then the maximum likelihood is always the, the Bayesian estimator? Um, so it, that's true. If I had a uniform prior, 
the maximum likelihood and maximum repository will be the same. <clears throat> and that would be the reasonable assumption if you didn't know that aliens are very rare and laziness is very prevalent, right? So, but a good engineer will pick a prior that accurately reflects the problem. So, for instance, if I was to look at the voltages coming from an outlet, I would probably pick a prior which says, well, either the voltage is going to be zero volts, or it's going to be in the order of 110 volts, right? Or if you grew up outside the United States, then quite often you might have 220 to 240 volts. But this is something a good engineer would do. And they would pick this as their prior, and they would use it to adjust what they read off from the measurement device when they plug it into an outlet. Very rarely would you see like a voltage of maybe 50 or 60 volts in an outlet. That would be very odd. The first thing a good electrician then would do is just measure again with a different voltmeter because they wouldn't believe it. So, but that's a very good question. Okay, good. So, now let's look at the optimization problem. This is exactly what we did last Friday. <coughs> we looked at, you know, one over n, or one half yi, minus f of xi and w squared, and then some coefficient times, you know, the penalty on w, that was actually not what was implemented. We actually implemented the maximum likelihood solution, but that's just because we could get away with it because we had so much data and very few parameters. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Can you explain uh, how you got from the second line to the third line? Okay, good. So going from the first to the second line is kind of straightforward, right? Because we have the likelihood term, and the second term is just a Gaussian assumption, and I dropped all the uh, you know, additive constants, right? I've just scooped them up on the right. Now, if I have this minimization problem, I can always multiply or divide by something without the problem really changing. So what I did is I divided by n, okay? and then multiply it by sigma squared. Okay. So what happens is, the first term here, right, that just becomes one over two n, the sum. The second term now acquires n times sigma squared, sorry, acquires sigma squared over sigma bar squared n. And I just renamed that. And I renamed that into lambda. Mind you, this, very, in, in hindsight, very obvious transformation had people stumped quite a bit when they were trying to compare Gaussian processes with support vector machines about 15 to 20 years ago. And for about one or two years, people were arguing about which one was better until somebody realized it's just a reparameterization. Okay, I'm oversimplifying things here, but um, yeah, this led to rather hilarious arguments that meant nothing. Um, okay, so 